What's up guys and welcome back to a brand new episode of Shark Bites. Today we're going to be having a look at some of the most insane predatory adaptations that are used by sharks and rays to catch their prey. I feel like I had this video idea absolutely ages ago and I did mention that I was going to do it at some point but for the life of me, I can't remember which video I said that in. Can any of you guys remember? If so, please do let me know in the comments below because then I can link to this one. God, my memory is so awful. <laughs> anyway, there's a ton of different strategies that these animals use to catch their prey and a lot of them are literally out of this world. When you think there's about 1,200 or so different shark and ray species around the world, the diversity in their feeding strategies is pretty remarkable. Some of these strategies you'll have heard before, but some of them today you might not have heard of. So strap yourselves in, you're in for a goodie. What's even more special about this episode though is that today we've got a very special guest. I've only managed to go and get the one and only Lindsay Nicole on the channel. I imagine many of you will have heard of or seen Lindsay's videos before, but for those of you that haven't, Lindsay, do you want to just really quickly introduce yourself and let us know what you're going to be doing for us today? Hello. I'm Lindsay. I'm a zoologist. I have a YouTube channel where we talk about animals and evolution, cool fossils, cool specimens. And today I'm going to be quizzing you throughout the video. So make sure you're paying attention because this is serious business. Awesome. So make sure you guys stick around because Lindsay's going to be popping up throughout the video. Right. Okay. Let's have a look at some of these predatory strategies then. Up first, we've got the tasseled wobbegong. The tasseled wobbegong is a flat bodied carpet shark that generally lives in the tropical waters of the Indo Pacific. Their body's very flat and their head is broad, but also flat, allowing them to lay almost flush to the seafloor. Their eyes are highly convergent, which means the eyes are able to perceive the distance and depth of an object incredibly well. Although their actual visual acuity, i.e. their ability to distinguish between shapes and objects is quite poor, which probably explains a decent number of unprovoked attacks on humans. Don't put your hands near the wobbegong, guys. Wobbegongs are known to employ a camouflage ambush predatory tactic. This kind of ambush is known as a lay in wait strategy where the wobbegong just sits around incredibly still and waits for its prey to come within striking distance of its mouth. Within that mouth are a ton of razor sharp needle like teeth that point backwards into the mouth and that allows them to trap whatever they've struck at lightning speed and force it down their throat, often head first and always whole. But it's the camouflage that's most impressive in these sharks. Their ornate color and patterning enables them to pretty much disappear amongst rocks, sand and coral. As well as that pattern and coloration, their tassels or dermal lobes are insanely complex. They've got about 24 to 26 pairs of dermal lobes scattered around the side and the front of the head. And these lobes form a highly branched structure that almost mimics that of seaweed or coral, meaning that they can blend in even better to their surroundings. There are quite a few sharks that use camouflage to help them, but for me, the tasseled wobbegong easily takes the trophy. Right, up next, we've got the manta rays. Both species of manta ray, the reef manta and the oceanic manta are filter feeders, swimming through dense patches of plankton and swallowing them down. You'll have heard before that the cephalic fins of manta rays, which are those flappy looking bits at the front of their faces, are appendages that mantas use to direct plankton into their mouths, which is a pretty cool adaptation in itself. But mantas also employ a different feeding strategy by how they swim. Manta rays can perform somersaults otherwise known as barrel rolls to help them catch their prey. The manta essentially does a really tight backflip rotating 360 degrees in the water column. The diameter of the backflip is less than the disc width of the animal's body so it really is quite a tight barrel roll and they can do this dozens of times in a row. Man, I'd get so dizzy doing that. <laughs> but mantas don't just use these strategies to catch their prey, they also use the help of one another to catch food. Reef manta rays have been documented using a range of cooperative strategies to two of which are piggyback feeding and cyclone feeding. In piggyback feeding, smaller individuals will often place themselves almost on top of a larger individual, matching the wing beats of the one below, and they swim horizontally in the water column together. It's been reported that this piggyback stack has occasionally numbered four individuals all on top of each other, creating a giant vertical plankton vacuum cleaner. The second strategy though, cyclone feeding, involves a lot more than four individuals. Again, it's only been observed in reef manta rays, but essentially what happens is a chain line of manta rays who are all feeding begin to curl around on each other until it creates a circle. As more and more manta rays join the circle, the column of individuals stretches right down into the water column, sometimes numbering 150 individuals all rapidly spinning around in the water like a cyclone. The cyclone can often go 20 meters down towards the bottom and can span 15 meters wide. So this is a big mass of fish, especially when you consider many of these mantas will have wingspans of three to four meters wide. Unlike 
like a cyclone though, the manta rays will always spin in an anti-clockwise direction. That always annoyed me why they called it that. It should have been hurricane feeding or typhoon feeding. Anyway, I digress. As to why the mantas always spin in an anti-clockwise direction, we have absolutely no idea. <laughs> but by creating this vortex, they start to create a mini eddy or a current that sucks plankton in towards the feeding mantas that helps them catch more food. The manta cyclone is one of the most impressive things that I think you can see in the marine world. So if you ever have the opportunity to go and swim with these animals, do it. As to all that spinning around, it's not for me. I get quite sick on spinning rides. I think I'm feeling quite dizzy just watching that footage. So to allow my brain to stop spinning around in circles, I'm gonna pass you over to Lindsay for a minute. All right, these are the first three questions of your quiz. Number one, what kind of shark is the tassel of Wabigong? A, rug shark. B, tuna shark. C, flounder shark. D, carpet shark. The answer is D, carpet shark. Next, number two, what is a key feature of the tasseled wabigong's predatory strategy? A, barrel rolling to catch prey. B, piggyback stack. C, camouflage and ambush. Or D, forming a cyclone to create a feeding vortex. The answer is C, camouflage and ambush. Next, number three, what cooperative feeding strategies are used by reef manta rays? A, piggyback stack. B, cyclone feeding. C, Ambush, or D, A and B. The answer is D, A and B, because that's always the answer when it's an option. Thanks, Lindsay. Did any of you guys put rug shark for question one? If you did, you are in so much trouble, despite how cute I imagine a tasseled rug shark would be. <laughs> okay, we're heading back to sharks again now, and I imagine quite a few of you will have heard of this one before. So next up, we've got the thresher shark. Thresher sharks are one of the most amazing shark species out there. I've never had the opportunity to dive with one before, but they are high on my list. And yep, you guessed it, we're gonna be talking about that insane tail. The thresher shark caudal fin can occasionally grow longer than the length of its body, and boy does it know how to use it. For years and years, scientists mutated used at its function, its ecological role, and its evolutionary significance. It was reportedly used for prey capture, but we only actually managed to get footage of this happening about 10 years ago. Instead of swimming headfirst into a shoal of fish and biting with its mouth to catch them, like most other shark species, the thresher swims at high speed and lunges its tail up and over its head, whipping the fish to stun them before moving in to eat the immobilized prey. This one is so cool. I think this has to be one of my absolute favorites. Thresher shark tail whipping consists of four different phases. Preparation, strike, wind down recovery, and prey collection. They begin in the preparation phase by lunging towards their targeted prey at rapid speeds. The strike phase begins by then lowering the head and flexing the body, which raises the tail over the head to create a whip-like motion. And then the wind down recovery phase consists of the shark returning to a swimming posture and eventually then consuming the stunned prey. Recent scientific research from January 2024 has shown that the vertebral anatomy of thresher sharks is highly specialized to allow them to perform this behavior. The vertebrae at the back of the shark is really modified with a mineralized structure that enables them to lift their tail over their heads at high speeds and whip it, somewhat similar to how a catapult works. The researchers also discovered that juvenile thresher sharks acquire these mineralized structures in their vertebrae as they develop. So when they're younger, they can't perform the tail whipping behavior because their vertebrae aren't quite strong enough yet. A real Indiana Jones of the shark world. I'm always impressed by that one. Speaking of stunning prey though, next up on our list, is the sawfish. We've seen so far that different appendages on a shark or ray's body can help it catch its prey. And sawfish have one of the most impressive appendages out there. Did I actually just say impressive appendage? <laughs> Anyway, the sawfish saw, more scientifically known as its rostrum, acts as a multifunctional tool for both sensing and capturing prey species. The rostrum is lined with ampullae of Lorenzini, those tiny pores which can detect electrical impulses from any living thing. And this is super important for sawfish because generally they live in water that is ridiculously murky. So it's their rostrum that allows them to find and detect that prey. And once they've found that prey, the rostrum switches its function entirely and becomes a 
literal weapon. They'll slash with that saw laterally from side to side, which either stuns or physically impales the fish. Sometimes those slashes are so hard, it's been reported that fish have actually been sliced in half from the impact. As well as this, they've even been seen to use the teeth on the saw to pin fish down onto the sea floor, after they've been stunned. Essentially, they're using their rostrum as a medieval soldier would use a sword. The behavior's only been filmed on a few occasions, some in the lab and even more rarely in the wild, so it really is a crazy thing to witness. Scientists working on sawfish in lab conditions have reported that they'll occasionally scrape the teeth of their rostrum along the bottom of the enclosure, and it's been suggested that this might actually be them sharpening the teeth to ensure they work properly when they hunt their prey. That is crazy. <laughs> right, okay, before we move on to our next predatory strategy, Lindsay's got another round of questions for you. So take it away, Lindsay. All right, I got two more questions for you. Let's see how you do. How do thresher sharks prepare for their tail whipping behavior? A, by swimming headfirst into a shoal of fish. B, lowering their tail slowly to avoid startling prey. C, lunging towards targeted prey at rapid speeds. Or D, sharpening their teeth along a nearby rock or hard surface. The answer is C, lunging at rapid speeds. Next, what's the primary function of a sawfish's rostrum during hunting? A, to saw through prey. B, to detect electrical impulses from prey. C, to confuse prey via appearance. Or D, to create a loud noise to disorient prey. The answer is B, to detect electrical impulses from prey. Cheers, Lindsay. Sawfish thrashing around making loud noises with their rostrum is a thing that I wish was real so badly. Loud noises! Okay, next up on our list of insane predatory strategies, we've got two different shark species, but a very similar strategy, and that's cooperative hunting. Cooperative hunting has been reported in a few different shark species, but it's probably best to lean on the side of caution when we really refer to it as cooperative. Social behavior is pretty poorly understood in most shark species, but we're learning more and more as the years go by. One shark species though, who likely does perform some form of cooperative hunting is black tip reef sharks. These relatively small shark species have been seen on occasion working together in groups of 10 or 15 to herd large schools of fish into the shallows. The sharks circle and push the shoal closer to shore and then take turns to dart quickly into the shoal to bite down on the fish occasionally beaching themselves in the process. Black tip reef sharks have been seen doing this to fish as well as stingrays, with all individuals eventually receiving some kind of prey reward at the end. Cooperative hunting has also been reported in seven gill sharks, especially when they're preying on larger prey species like a seal. The hunting behavior on seals hasn't ever been filmed in the wild before, but we do have anecdotal reports of it happening. It's said that typically a cooperative attack begins when a group of seven gills form a loose circle around the prey item. They then stop the seal from exiting the circle and eventually it tightens around it. Finally, one or two sharks will move in to bite the prey and this initiates all the other sharks to move in and get their share. Although it's not been filmed happening before with seals, some researchers may have experienced the beginning of a hunting sequence on a Discovery Channel show nearly 10 years ago. Again, it's pretty tough to know for sure whether this was territoriality or the beginning of a cooperative hunting strategy, but the divers quickly found themselves surrounded by four or five seven gills who may have been attempting to tighten the circle around those divers. The divers in question called off the dive before it got a bit too hectic, but we may have been seeing the signs of cooperative hunting on that occasion. Admittedly, it's tough to say with 100% certainty. I imagine in the coming years, we're going to learn so much more about social and cooperative hunting in other different shark species. It has been suggested for white sharks, but the evidence for it at the moment is fairly minimal. So there we go, guys. Those are some pretty amazing predatory strategies from the shark and ray world. There's so many more other amazing predatory strategies that we just haven't spoken about today, though, like breaching behavior or bioluminescent luring. So if you did want to see another video on this topic, make sure you let me know in the comments below. Massive thanks to Lindsay for coming across onto Shark Bites today. Please do show us some love in the comments. And if you're after some more collaborative content between me and Lindsay, make sure you head over to her channel and check out a video that I'm featured in all about the Permian period of Earth. In that video, I talk about two ridiculously weird prehistoric shark species that were swimming around during the Permian period. So make sure you go and check that out on Lindsay's channel. Of course, I will also post the link in the description for you. Before you all head off though, today we've learned about some amazing predatory strategies used by sharks and rays. But have you ever wondered how you can read the behavior of sharks? Well, in this video right here, I taught you through some of the body signals that are given off by sharks and how you can recognize those signals. So make sure you give it a watch here.